you need to educate them and you need to set limits. Like there's educational games, it's Minecraft, Roblox. They can learn, they can build things or whatever. But like if your kid's playing Minecraft for 11 hours a day, they're not some computer coding genius. They're just a kid playing a video game. Love and light, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of El Podcast, the greatest virtual happy hour in the world. My name is Kai Primo, and I am joined by my fiance and super co-host, Jesse Wright. If you're new to our podcast, we thank you for watching and finding us. Please remember to subscribe on YouTube and Rumble. And you can also find the podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from. Our guest today is David Sachs. David is an award-winning writer and keynote speaker. He is the author of the book, the future is analog, how to create a more human world. So we're really excited about today's topic. So be sure to grab a beverage, sit back and enjoy the show. David, thank you so much for joining us in a podcast today. In your book, The Future is Analog, uh, it basically is essentially your memoir of your time in lockdown in Toronto uh, during the pandemic and how moving Nearly everything online, such as school, religious services, concerts, theaters, book clubs, weddings, and work became lonely, frustrating, heartless, time-consuming, and fatiguing. The digital utopian future that thought leaders in Silicon Valley promise us essentially did not work, and, it, it, and that it actually makes society worse. And your solution to this is to do things, to go back to the analog world and do things in the real world. Would you say that would be a, a fair 30-second summary of the book? Yeah, that's great. <laughs> well done. For our audience, describe how this idea that we must move back to analog during lockdown, when did that kind of seep into your mind? Well, to be fair, I mean, I had been writing about this and thinking about this for a while. In 2016, I had a book come out called Revenge of Analog. And that was looking at the sort of growing reemergence of non-digital technologies and why it was happening. So it looked at vinyl records and paper goods and moleskin notebooks, books and bookstores, film cameras, board games, and so on. All these things that we were told were obsolete and were growing again and kind of continued to grow over the past decade and a half, despite all the predictions for their demise. And so it, it was something, it was a topic that I was already writing about, thinking on as an advocate for the sort of virtue and value of analog, even in, in digital companies and in the use of creating technology. I talked about that. And so when the pandemic began and everybody was locked in and shut down, I was getting a lot of requests to speak about what does this mean for the future of analog? And everything was sort of along the same lines, which was, now that everything is digital and everything is online, what is the purpose? There's not going to be any place for the non-digital things and places. Like we don't need gyms anymore because we now all have connected Peloton bikes. We don't need schools anymore because every kid's learning online. No one's ever going to go back to an office. Every stores are done. They're toast because everybody's ordering everything on Amazon or on other e-commerce sites. So what is the future of analog? Like there's no, there's no place for analog in the digital future is kind of what a lot of people were predicting and a lot of people were sort of challenging me to answer. And this book in a way was my answer to that, which is, okay, let's go through that experience we went through. Let's unpack what it would actually like when we moved all of our life online into this digital world, into the, the promised sort of digital infrastructure and architecture of the future and examine what that actually felt like, what it gave us, what it took away from us and where did it show the value that maybe we didn't even think about before of analog spaces and relationships, right? Physical spaces, schools, offices, churches, synagogues, stores, libraries, whatever you want to call it, but also more importantly, the relationships that happen there, the face-to-face -face interactions with coworkers, with friends, with fellow students, with teachers, with shopkeepers, with baristas, with whatever it is in all of these areas of our life that suddenly many people were saying, you don't need to go to these places anymore. You never need to leave your house. You can just do everything from your phone. And isn't this wonderful? This is the future we want. And now, Hey, you can do it in VR, like even better. You, can, you don't even need to like look at things. You can just strap a screen to your eyes. This is where we're going and this is inevitability. And what I'm 
talking about in this book is, okay, let's actually unpack what that was like, right? And question this from a critical perspective before we sort of accept this future as our inevitable destiny. I wonder if we can go on the macro side. This is really interesting. I'm going to go on to say, I think we're probably in the, about in the same generation. I was born in 81. Jesse was born in 82. And I think when we Googled, you're just a couple of years older than us. So we're pretty much the last generation. 79. 79. Yeah. So we're pretty much the last generation that was able to, to experience the beauty of the analog world before the iPhone came out in 07. The computers were coming out, and et cetera, but we didn't have these phones that... Well, we grew up, we're the first generation that really grew up with digital in all its initial forms. There are people who are computer scientists at the Defense Department in MIT in the 1960s and 70s who can talk about those sort of systems. But like your average human being in the wealthy Western world, in North America, Western Europe, and other places, the 1980s and 90s were a time when you saw the introduction of all these digital technologies. I very specifically remember the first computer my parents got, a beige compact in 85, which is the same year we probably got a Nintendo Entertainment System. I remember my teenage babysitter hooking up the modem to our phone. And, you know, like, what the hell are you doing? He's like, I'm going to download Operation Wolf, like 19 floppy disks later, you know, over the course of 20 hours, all of it, like self, the first self, you know, car phones, cell phones, you know, Blackberries, you know, uh, AOL, Prodigy into like Ethernet and chat boards and every iteration of this digital universe we now sort of can easily access everywhere and anywhere our generation was the first to see the introduction of that, right? We were there when all this, you're like, I remember when this shit began. You know, it's like, I remember logging on to AOL for the first time. I remember creating a Facebook account. I remember all these different things as they came into our life. That puts us in an interesting perspective because for the generation of our parents, the baby boomers, they were like, there was a world before computers. And then at some point in our middle adulthood, this world of computers came upon us. And we have this strong contrast. Those who've come after us, whatever, Gen Z, Y, whatever you want to call them, um, they, millennials, they're, digital is this ubiquitous thing that's always been there. My kids have never grown up without being able to take a photo on an iPhone. So our perspective is a little different. We're that bridge generation that saw not only the technologies that are here now, but also the bridge technologies, mini discs, and CDs, right? CD-ROMs. Yeah, that technology barely exists anymore unless someone's collecting retro things. But when do you... Retro mini discs. Yeah. <laughs> um, but because we went through that transitionary period, and then now it's like the old generation, Gen Z, basically grew up with these things. When do you see us sliding back into the analog? Because Jesse talks about this a lot, where the pendulum does end up swinging eventually. How do you predict us sliding back into the analog? Well, it's not a, it's not a sliding back to the analog. Like it's not a rejection of the technology and a return to sort of 1980 living, uh, despite the Cold War coming back to where it was, um, uh, and and various fashion as well. It is this swing of the pendulum of um, sort of finding a balance and balancing the technologies that are newest and most novel, which are the digital technologies with technology that pre-existed that and still has relevance. So one of the things that I find interesting and is pretty consistent across all the different analog technologies and spaces that I've been writing about and sort of chronicling over the past really decade as they've had their resurgence grown is that it's actually those younger generations, the ones who are digital natives, as they're often called, who are the driving force behind it. The driving force behind the return of vinyl records, the driving force behind the growth in paper book sales, the shoppers of brick and mortar bookstores, board games, even typewriter sales now to take a strange metric. It's all driven by younger people. It's not our generation. It's not our parents' generation who are like, man, I really really miss typewriters and I want to buy one, right? Tom Hanks aside. 
it's people who have grown up with digital for whom digital is ubiquitous. It's not going away. It's like the sun. They're saying, well, what else is there out there? Right. My kids who are nine and six, we have an Instax camera and a Polaroid camera. They love that. That's the coolest thing in the world. Taking pictures on a phone, whatever. They do that every day. It's no big deal. They just grab our phone, take a photo, nothing special. But a picture that actually comes out of a camera and you can hold and give to your friends, like that is amazing. That is a thing. So like Fujifilm's sales of Instax cameras and film, it's like driven by kids. Right. And they're not saying, well, which is the better technology, analog or digital? They're like, okay, I can take a million pictures on this thing, but this thing's super cool in a way that's different. I'm not going to give up my iPhone. I'm not going to give up my Instagram account or whatever it is if I'm a teenager or 20 year old, but I can also do this thing. And maybe I'll even take a picture of it and upload it to social media. It's a pendulum swing in that cultural way, but it's also people seeking out things that engage with their entire existence, which is physical, right? They still have bodies and those bodies need to hold things and touch things and engage with things in ways that's more interesting and engaging than just a flat piece of glass. In your book, you write on the last day of virtual school, my daughter slammed her laptop shut and told me, I just want to smash this thing. Do you think that the younger generations have been so scarred from this digital virtual world for about three years of being locked down that these kids might almost have some PTSD or have nightmares of digital future? When we've been hanging out with younger people, they are on their phone significantly less than the older people around them. I know a lot of younger people where it's like they see their parents just being insane from social media that they want nothing to do with it. No one loves an iPad like a boomer, right? No one loves an iPad like a grandparent. That's it. To them, it's still a magical technology. It's this new thing. It's amazing what it can do. But to a kid, like, don't get me wrong. If I let my son, if I gave my son access, unlimited access to my brother's Nintendo Switch, he would sit there and play that until he died of starvation. Like he is like a dog given an unlimited amount of dog food, right? Like, but he's a six-year-old. I was like that at six as a kid too with Nintendo, like, you know, 8-bit Nintendo. If you could find me a child, an elementary school kid or a high schooler who was like, yeah, Virtual school all the way. Like, this is amazing. I don't need to be in a class. I don't need to be with other friends. And that has nothing to do with some generational thing. Humans have bodies, younger people, older people, doesn't matter what that is. Those bodies can only be engaged so much by sitting still in a chair and looking at a piece of glass, a rectangle of glass for X number of hours a day. I think we just made this idiotic, simplistic assumption which is these kids are so good with these computers. It's all they want, these kids, right? Look at these kids and how good they are with the computers. If we just give them computers, then that's what they want. That's the future of whatever you call it, education, play, entertainment, engagement, whatever. It's like kids love Nintendo. They love video games. They're like They still love to run around in a playground. They still love to play soccer. They still love to go to a beach. They still love to go to Disneyland or God forbid. Um, <laughs> really don't want to do that trip. But uh, they still want the things that we wanted, right? And our parents wanted, which is they want to engage with the world. There are some extreme examples of South Korean gaming children who like teenagers who die of starvation because they're not given any limits. But those are the extreme outliers. We have to question why we made that assumption, why we made that stupid, reductive idea of like, oh, this teenager really likes the TikTok. Therefore, that's all they want. And everything needs to be on that. And this is the future of everything. We all came up against those limits. Getting back to what this book is about is the pandemic, especially the kind of early months of it, when everyone in the world was kind of locked in, except for some people in New Zealand. It forced us into this AB experiment, this dystopian experiment of like, okay, you love digital? Everything digital now. How do you like it now? What works for you and what doesn't? For some people, they're like, you know what? The working from home thing, I don't have to commute. I can move to Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico and live life in San Juan in my beautiful house where only one of us has enough internet to stream. This is great. I don't want to go back to an office in Boston or LA or Houston or wherever. For other people, it's like, no, I miss human beings. I can't sit in my house the whole time. The pandemic forced us to reckon with that. 
to take this sort of idea of a utopian digital future from this abstract concept, like a messianic prophecy that you read in some sort of religious tract and be like, okay, here it is now. This is it. Here you are. You wanted to like only buy things online and only order restaurant food from a delivery service. Well, there you go. That's your only option. Are you content or do you realize you want something else? Yeah, I definitely see your point there. I recently had a job interview up in the mainland and to be around a work environment once again, like an office, I kind of crave that. I didn't realize how much I missed it because I work remote. I do a lot of freelance work aside from this podcast, but I crave the environment that the community that it brought you or the little conversations that you have in the kitchen. It really opened my eyes. I miss this. I want this back. So you're totally right. It kind of showed me that I care about that kind of environment and the community in your workplace. That's an interesting point. Speaking of being in a workplace, talk about productivity and technology. So you wrote in your book, and I quote, despite the tremendous advances in digital technology and their inventors' promise to bring about a productivity revolution, it remains a mystery to economics why measures of productivity seem to have stalled over the past few decades. Then further down on the page, you continue to say that digital technology has actually brought us the opposite, a decline in productivity, rather than liberating us from uh, unproductive tasks, as promised, digital tools like email, instant messaging, video meetings, and so on have inundated us with pointless time-sucking distractions, end of quote. So I was wondering if you can elaborate on these quotes, because I guess for me, the fact that we can have a meeting with someone on the other side of the world, I find that more efficient rather than flying around the world to accomplish the same tasks. I would be thinking we're a little more productive, but please elaborate on the quotes. It's called the productivity paradox. It's a pretty well-documented um, phenomenon over the past 50 or so years it's that, you know, when you had, when you had the industrial revolution at the end of the 19th century, right. And the introduction of machines and the creation of sort of automated assembly lines, the way that work was done, the rate of productivity just exploded. You were making a shoe and instead of like one guy in a cobbler shop in Manchester, making well, one pair of shoes a week, suddenly factory outs in the city powered by steam or these giant turbines and a mechanized assembly line would be able to crank out hundreds of pairs of shoes a day. And that obviously grew the wealth of these nations, grew the wealth of these things, created all sorts of problems about inequality and people's livelihoods and so on. But that was the sort of leap of productivity. So when digital computers and digital technology started entering the world of business in the 1970s, 1980s, really, there was this assumption uh, that we would see a similar explosion in productivity for non-manufacturing jobs, right? So there's increase in productivity in the way that cars are made once Toyota and GM and other companies introduced robots to the assembly line that could crank out more cars per hour. But in terms of law firms and software development and ad agencies and newspapers and publication, whatever, like that growth in productivity didn't happen. What did happen? What happened is that we got more tools to do more things quicker, but the time wasn't filled by just getting the thing done in a better, more efficient way. It just added more work to it. One email leads to another email, leads to another email, leads to another email. So it's, it could be really summed up by, should this email chain have been a phone call or a meeting, right? Like I have to talk to something about you, Kai, we're working on a project. We really need to like get this thing decided. I send you an email. I write back for that email. You send me an email. I get back for the email. You send me a text. You send a text back and forth, PDF back and forth, blah, 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 over the course of months and months and months and like iterating on the smallest, stupidest details. And maybe if you and I had just been sitting in a room together for like three hours, it would have gotten done because we could just do it in that way. And the technology actually just creates more layers of busy work or pointless tasks that are built in inherent to 
the sort of nature of that software. So someone who's written about this a lot is Cal Newport, who's a friend of mine, a brilliant writer, and someone who's a computer scientist and focuses a lot on productivity. He talks about how the problem is that the notion of productivity is still stuck on this idea of like units of output from the 19th century. It's still like, how many shoes can you make in an hour? But software development, finance, art and creativity, advertising, publishing, consulting, the sort of large profit-driven parts of our information economy, they're not driven in that way. It's not about maximizing output in terms of the most amount of things you can do. It's about the quality of the work, the quality of the ideas. And that isn't served by doing things faster and faster and faster and faster, right? And so we keep doing things faster and faster and faster, and it doesn't actually lead us to more productive things. So Slack, like Slack was introduced and it was like, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be so much more productive. Like now we can communicate with every team across everything, blah, 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 blah. And we could share, you know, all these different files and whatever. It's going to be seamless. And Microsoft's like, we have teams, teams are the same, just crappier. And everyone comes on with their own version of this. And what does it do? It's just like endless, 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 endless texts and communication and, you know, calendar things to synchronize some other stupid online meeting where like people just like, let's circle up, let's, no, 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 let's put a pin in this. No, 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 no. We've got a hard stop at five, got a hard stop at four, like, and nothing actually gets done. So that's in short, not really short, in a wasted digital way, right? A summation of this productivity paradox. And now everyone's saying like, well, now we have AI, we have chatbot, you know, chat GPT, chat GPT three, four, five, like this is going to be the productivity revolution. We're not going to waste time with this, but you're just going to find it's going to be the same version of that with a different tool. People will just be chat GPT three and everything. And oh, let's just chat GPT three it. And you know, we'll, we'll, we'll sort of get that in and that'll, that'll sort of take care of it. And it's just going to like, build in more layers of this sort of busy work that again is just it just fills a void right yeah yeah you definitely make a no sorry and rant and rant and rant and rant <laughs> you get fired up no you definitely make a point on that aspect of it although i i still love my little tools that do help me things like canva no so like no one's saying like no one's saying get rid of those tools, right? I function with email. I function with messaging. I use these tools to do interviews with people who aren't nearby, who to coordinate things with my publisher. I don't want to have to be like typing out manuscripts and mailing them to my publisher to send them back, right? I like to do things in Word or Google Docs or whatever and share these things. But with each tool that we add on, we do create more busy work that gets in the way of the actual tasks that we're doing. And these tools can become this sort of crutch. So it's like, oh, we can do a virtual meeting. We can do a virtual meeting. We can do a virtual meeting. And yet you could find you do 10 virtual meetings and nothing actually happened. So in the book, I interview this woman, Kolstad, who's the head of facilities and interior design at Ford, the motor company in Detroit. And during the course of the pandemic, they were trying to figure out their like future of Ford work plan. And over months and months and months, they like her and her team was around the world. were like working on all this different software platforms, instant messaging, Zoom meetings, Teams, Miro for design stuff. And it was just like, they just kept getting bogged in the details and it never got anywhere. And finally they're like, all right, everybody fly to Detroit. We like rented an office, put your mask on, bring your vaccination certificates. It's like mid pandemic, like we're going to try to do this in person. And in three hours in a room, they got it done because the productivity, the tool of productivity that actually was the thing that was missing was their bodies in the same space. And we forget that our bodies are and our minds are accustomed and have evolved to coordinate and collaborate and work together with other human bodies in a shared space. And that allowed them to sort of get those ideas to a place where they all agreed on and sort of move forward. Whereas the tools of design, even though they're ostensibly tools of productivity, were proving to be anti-productive. Yeah, it's interesting as you're talking about this. I remember when you talked about this in your book where you said that 
basically face-to-face -face conversation is vastly superior to virtual chats. And then you talk to an expert, I believe Headley was the name, and he identified three areas where we derived conversational meaning, language, what we were saying, tone of voice, how we we're saying it, and body language, how we appear to be saying it. And then you go on to say in your book that digital communications typically removes about two thirds of conversational meaning. Even the best video call removes at least one. You can't make direct eye contact, the lag in the connection, as we have now. Yeah, I can't even see you right now. So, right. I mean, <laughs> how, however, <laughs> right. And however small it messes with timing and the limited field of vision restricts our perception of body language. Digital processing alters the voice nuance and flattened hints of emotions. And the signal is weak, even when it seems strong. The fatigue that we feel after a long session trying to talk online, whether a conference call or a chat with siblings, has little to do with what is being said. As a result, your brain is trying to play catch up with all those missed and scrambled signals. And it reminds me of the movie with Will Smith, where he's the dating coach, where basically he says that most of communication is nonverbal. You talk about this a lot in the book about empathy and there's no empathy. You really can't make that happen. I think it's one reason I never really got on social media and why I don't think the metaverse would ever work is people are just dicks online. They'll say things online that they would never in a million years say to your face or even behind your back in the same room. Yeah. I, I think again, it's, you know, I get asked a lot on these podcasts and other interviews, like what was the most surprising thing you learned researching this book? And the most surprising thing to me is how people just assumed and how many people just assumed and bought into the assumption that we could move our entire lives out in the physical, real three-dimensional world onto the internet and it wouldn't make a fucking difference. <laughs> like it'd be like we could take school like an elementary school, buildings, classes, desks, crap on walls, old washrooms, a bunch of kids in a room, toys, lunches, smells, the bell ringing, teachers, you know, fights and paper and songs and music and all that stuff, the recess, the schoolyard, and like smash it into Google Classroom and it wouldn't make a difference, right? We could take a concert like a Rihanna concert in a stadium and watch it on a phone and it would be the same. It's just, it's, I, I think our, our cognitive desire to like make this leap for the purposes of profit or ease or whatever, just got so far away from the anchored reality of our physical presence. And we realized that. We realized that very quickly on. Like, I think there was this initial, like, March 20th, 2020, like, look at me. Like, I'm I'm working in my shorts in Costa Rica. Or, sorry, Puerto Rico. Um, or Costa Rica. I'm, I'm pedaling on a bicycle and there's a studio in New York City. Like, look at me. I'm ordering pad thai and it's being delivered to me in, in a box and I could assemble it with a video. This is awesome. And within two weeks, someone's like, oh my God, I, just, I want nothing more than to go and eat a hot dog at a counter somewhere or like my life for my child to be back in school or I would kill for a boring office Monday morning. I think it's that naivete that we could just take our world that we live in and is our reality and replace it with something that we've created on a screen. This is that sort of promise of the metaverse, right? It's like Zuckerberg comes out, I don't know, two years ago, and he's like, we're changing Facebook. It's called Meta now. And the future is the metaverse. And we're all going to live in virtual reality. And like, this is going to be this wonderful improvement in our world. Isn't it great? And there were a few people who were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. The metaverse. Woo, woo. We're like, how, how is our brand shifting to the metaverse? And most people are like, what? Huh? My favorite analogy from your book is you made the comparison between road rage and keyboard warriors. You write, the analog equivalent of social media rage was road rage. When you're in a car, you have a metal and glass buffer between you and the real world. That makes you so much more likely to be aggressive, angry, honking, flipping people off than if you were just walking down the street. The medium of the car's protective interior facilitates a kind of psychopathic behavior. 
It blocks you from humanity and empathy. The glass and metal cage in your hands is no different. You can honk and yell and rev your rhetorical engine and then zip away to some other corner of the web. Sight unseen, no worse. I've never heard the analogy between road rage before and being a keyboard warrior, but I think it's the most perfect analogy and that really stuck with me in the book. Yeah, this isn't reality, right? There's real people behind it, but like I could go on some horrible rant right now. I can insult you both. I could be racist. I know this podcast is on Rumble, so I guess that's expected of me, but I don't know you. You're in Puerto Rico and th there wouldn't be too many physical consequences to me. It probably would get rack up more listens. So maybe it's to everyone's benefit to do that because it's engaging. Whereas you and I can have a very civil, boring conversation at a cafe in person in san juan and it doesn't need to be engaging in that way it doesn't need to get clicks we don't need to monetize it there's so many ways to sort of unpack why that is and so much of that is just due to the financial architecture of social media and sort of how it became and that's shushana zuboff and, and the rise of surveillance capitalism she really sort of talks about that and jaron lanier who's the one that wrote social media turns people into assholes but it's again, when you remove people from the reality of being human, of requiring that a aspect of empathy, and everything is gamified and twisted in this way through a business model or through a technology, then the behavior is going to change. And for the most part, that behavior doesn't change for the better. We've seen that. We know what it does. We know how increasingly toxic time spent on those forums are. Right. And if you talk to most people, they're like, Hey, like, should you set up a social media camp for your kids? Most people are like, yeah. like I will, I'll give them cigarettes before I do that. Do you, uh, and now you're going to cut it. It's like, this guy recommends giving children your cigarettes. What do you think? <laughs> oh to, uh, by, by the way, YouTube would do the, uh, YouTube would ban us before anything else. We don't care. We wish we did. Yeah. We, yeah. We received. Yeah, no strikes. Uh, so we we have we had to have rubble as a backup just in case. I, I was. Everyone needs their Nazi backup. <laughs> oh, and canceled and by the canceled. Nazis. So that's all I'll take it. And canceled just because I like we find that we have to bleep things. That's the other thing that scares me a lot about this quote, i.e., technological revolution is is the censorship but we're more and more being watched like everything every click every whatever it's an accumulation of all your behaviors and habits and we didn't have that before we didn't have this and so what do you think are the repercussions of that number one to our psyche and how we behave and then not being able to feel like we do have our first amendment and our right to speak if we continue in this period you know. yeah that's a big big sort of weighty complicated issue I think, again, it's sort of technological, digitally driven future has been pitched and sold to us as this unfettered good, right? This utopian state. And this is the same with every iteration of this technology. We saw it with social media. When social media came out in, I don't know, 2005 or whatever, look on Twitter around that time. <clears throat> and it was like this optimism of this is going to bring people together. Everyone in the world's going to get a say and everyone in the world's going to like come together and spread the messages of what they want to do and humanity is going to come as one. And that's true except for the fact that the way it was designed to reward engagement, it gave everybody a say, but it gave more say and more voice and more power to those who say things that are shitty. Let's just call it. So what do you do about that? Are you like, well, everybody should have the ability to say whatever they want, but the people who say the worst stuff, the inflammatory stuff, the racist stuff, the mean stuff, the lies, whatever, we're going to actually give them more airtime because that gets us more ad dollars. And at the end of the day, we still have to make money and that gets us more money. So what do you do for that? We're not talking about some theoretical consequences of like, oh, you know, I want to be able to speak about certain speech. We're talking about speech that has led to mass murders, genocides, pretty much like brinksmanship of American democracy and the almost destruction of the American democratic system, as well as the democratic system in other countries. This is not some theoretical university poli sci. Oh, what if we were to allow people to sort of talk freely. This is where you take the entirety of human speech and ideas, which has always been 
flawed. It's not, and we're not talking about an idealized world before this, but you stuff it through this digital engine of conversation that is gamified and weaponized to, like you said, reward the shittiest behavior. So the person who's like, well, I think we should have a civil conversation about democracy. It's like, ah, sorry, that's, you got like 200 likes, buddy. But this guy over here who's saying we should rebuild Auschwitz, he's got like 2 million views. So, um, you know, we're going to put that to the top of the thing. And it's one thing to say, well, we support free speech, whatever we believe. But when it literally leads to people going on racist murdering sprees and live streaming it to video game platforms like Twitch or spreading hate propaganda that leads to genocides in places like India and Myanmar and Rwanda. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? That's like the question that nobody has a good answer for. Do you shut these, all these platforms down? No, because they also provide benefits in all sorts of ways from your, your seeing your friend's photos of their vacation to dating to a writer or someone like you getting your podcast out and ideas to people to politicians and civil organizations doing constructive things, or maybe it's earthquake relief in Turkey and Syria right now. But how do you balance that by not allowing these platforms to be co-opted to the point where it, I don't know, leads to war. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> don't ask me. If you yeah. <laughs> and I doubt you have it either. Do you have any thoughts on Elon's Twitter currently? It seems the same as the old Twitter. Yeah. Just as shitty. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Like, is it any different than it was before? I haven't seen it, but I'm not a power user. Back to the work part. After the pandemic, we had the quote unquote silent quitting where people just either quit their job or basically people weren't going back into the workforce. How much do you think that people really realized how pointless their job was? There's a famous book called Bullshit Jobs. I think David wrote an article in 2013 and then in 2015, he came out with a full book, but he basically says 40 to 50% of jobs are completely pointless. He mentions corporate attorneys and HR. He mentions a lot of different jobs. Like, you're saying once you take out the human element, once you're no longer going to work, hanging out with your friends, and you're just like going to the work, it really exposed that the vast majority of people, or at least half of people, have a job that not only does not contribute to society, but in many respects, like a hey, corporate attorney, they're actually doing harm to society. Yeah, I'm not judging anyone's particular job, but I think people have experienced what this is and a dissatisfaction with it. I think this is something that the pandemic highlighted because when you removed – what happened when you removed yourself from the office and replaced all your work with sort of a home version of this is like you only had the work. The only thing that you had left was just the tasks you had to do in the work. And so it became very, very clear – that all those other things, the perks of the office and the, maybe there was cafeteria, the location or the relationships or the friendships or the mentorships or the social interactions or the travel or whatever it is, the conferences, like all those things were gone. And it was just like, you must do these tasks and we will give you this money. For a lot of people, it became a real wake up call because it just was so blatant. My wife is a career coach. So she deals with a lot of these people as her clients. And she saw this real sort of uptick and this instant dissatisfaction with work that was very hard for them to put their finger on. And a lot of it, I think, was driven by the disembodiment of themselves from the work environment. And maybe it just made clear something they were feeling, but out of habit, they were going in or necessity. Now, as we're teetering on the brink of recession and especially in the world of technology where you guys work, like all that free Saudi money isn't there anymore. No one's valuations like going up, like things are on the sort of down. People are kind of holding on to their bullshit jobs a little bit. And that sort of pure economic reality of, well, bullshit job, but mortgage, you know, um, food. Yeah. In your book, you wrote stripped of its analog space. School is reduced to the barest curriculum, facts, figures, lessons, exercises, tests, evaluations, basically homework. I mean, you can replace school in that sentence with work or concert, almost anything. And 
it's a hundred percent accurate for the average person work was the most visceral, but you could replace that with any other one of those words you'd want to use. Yeah. And I think it gets down to the, this core idea, which is the sort of, I guess, biggest contrast between digital and analog, right. And the sort of promise of this world where digital will become everything. And what I'm saying, which is that no analog is still going to be the center. We think in digital, like everything is information. It's codified bits of information that are in ones and zeros. The more information there is, the more ones and zeros there are. But if we just get enough of that information into the computer and use AI and, you know, advanced graphics and implants in our eyes or whatever, like we'll get to a point where there's going to be enough information that will satisfy us and actually supersede the sort of information we can get in the real world. But when we go about it in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, going to work, waking up with our loved ones, going surfing in Puerto Rico, walking down the street, going for lunch, going to get a coffee, seeing a concert, going to church on Christmas Eve, I don't know, whatever it is that we do. It's not just information. We're experiencing things with our bodies and our minds in real life. And that's not going away. That's not something that's going to diminish. And the more stuff that we try to move online, the greater the value of that real life is going to be. That real life is analog. That real life is the reality of like, we are animals in bodies that are living on a planet. And our greatest interaction, our greatest meaning, our greatest ideas, our greatest purpose comes from that, not from the bits of information that we get and bytes of information that we get on a computer. Yeah, that's that's a really powerful thesis that you just said there. I'm pretty sure the screen time of everybody is pretty high. There's a lot of people that spend countless hours on the phone with apps, etc. I wonder if we're going to snap out of that and just like taking in information and all kinds of content, basically that yearning to participate outside and feel things and experience things in a different manner. I hope so. It's going to be different for everyone, but I think everybody, ultimately that's that what we want. There are certain people out there, Mark Zuckerberg, who want, crave nothing more than sort of that virtual existence heading to that perfect utopia or, or Ray Kurzweil and the sort of singularity and that belief in like a digital transhumanism. But most people want to walk on a beach. Most people want to sit down at a restaurant and have that great meal. Most people want to go to a school or a job. They're challenged and they feel a sense of community and meaning and part of something bigger than just the tasks that they're doing. And I don't think that's going to change. And I think each of us just comes to that realization or that moment in, in different ways in different times of our lives. And sometimes it goes back and forth. Right. I track some of my own personal habits. And sometimes when I'm going through kind of a high stress period, instead of walking outside, and we live at the beach, right? So we're super blessed about that. We can go in the backyard and go for a walk. But sometimes when high stress has kicked in and I'm kind of going through it, I would prefer to just bury myself in this game that I do. It's called Two Dots. And I will clear my mind playing games or watching YouTube shorts. So sometimes I, for some reason, I'm, dr I know I've, I, I'm drawn to the screen over going outside. And then sometimes I do want to go outside and say, what do you think is so addictive that our coping mechanism has become screen time? It's there. It's free. It requires no effort. It's designed by individuals and companies employing the best and most advanced behavioral science to be addictive. YouTube shorts is like, oh my God, how can we take YouTube and turn it into methamphetamine or just copy TikTok? I have lost an hour of my life to YouTube shorts. It's insane. And here's the thing. After that hour's done, I feel like shit. I feel as though I have wasted one hour of my life. But I don't feel like that when I go walk outside for an hour. Do you, do you think that... Um, the this clip brought to you by YouTube Shorts. <laughs>
<laughs> That's going to be a short. <laughs> cat video. Jumping on the thing. Cat video. Some clip of America's Got Talent. Like, uh, yeah. It's so easy to get sucked into it. And I, again, I watch my own behaviors and I try to make shifts. But I wonder in your research for the book, did you find actual research of the effects of screen time to our brains, young and old? Yeah, there is a growing field of this in psychology and mental health studies, behavioral science. Adam Alters, a friend of mine, has written a fabulous book called Irresistible about how companies that create phones and social media have used the exact techniques of um, gambling and slot machine design to create things like YouTube shorts or the scroll functions on all these platforms in order to get us to keep engaging ourselves in order to sell more ads in order to make more money. The effects are now being seen and it's everything from a lack of, you know, physical exercise and heightened stress to a decrease in empathy. The biggest public health crisis of our era is loneliness. Loneliness is this growing worldwide phenomenon that has all these horrendous detrimental effects on people's mental and physical health. We're talking about people who are lonelier, people who are isolated of elevated rates of drug addiction, alcohol addiction, self-harm, suicide, even higher rates of injury from like tripping on stairs, like things you would never imagine would be correlated as well as other physical things like heart health, diabetes, cancer, like if someone's lonelier, their incidence of those injuries, disease, and death goes up from all every other possible cause. There was an article I was just reading in the New York Times yesterday, and it was talking about it's Valentine's Day special, and it was talking about sex, like the amount of sex people are having, the fundamental human biological act of our creation and self propagation on the earth is declining rapidly, especially among younger people. And where are they spending their time? What are they doing? What is driving this in a big way? If you're sitting on YouTube shorts for an hour each night, you're not a banging. And, no. and what's better for you? Banging or YouTube shorts? <laughs> you guys are engaged. I'm not going to ask you this question personally, but I wish right. success and longevity in your marriage and many children. But, but I can hear the laughter in the other room. I like that. Um, and this is Valentine's Day. This is a Valentine's Day special of El Podcast. But let's just like extrapolate that. If people are too busy, couples, and I'm my wife and I are guilty of doing this too. If the two of you are lying in bed looking at Instagram shorts or YouTube shorts or TikTok or Twitter and not being two humans in a bed together. What does that say about the future of humanity? I'd like to close yeah. on that. <laughs> I got one quick question, if that's fine. If, if, as if long as it relates that. to your intimate personal life. Yes. <laughs> right. I, I'm not just a writer. I'm a sex therapist. As you're a sex therapist. Ago. Yeah. <laughs> Typically, Jesse Deep. does have to tell me to put the phone down. So I'm listening to this therapy yeah. session is important to me. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that there will be a pushback, like people will eventually kind of rebel against this technology? Right now, basically, you have Silicon Valley, which is kind of like the Gilded Age or the Robber Baron Age. The wealth gap in North America and most of the world is larger now than it was during the Gilded Age with the Rockefellers and Carnegie and all these others. Right now, we have this sharing economy where they act like the workers are benefiting. Oh, you can be an Uber driver or you can have an Airbnb and rent out your house. The only reason you're renting a room out on your house, you're driving cars because you don't have an option. Who wants to be cruising around in their car, picking up a bunch of drunk people at two o'clock in the morning and picking up or cleaning up puke out of the back seat? And then who's enriching this, right? You have all the people at Uber who aren't really making much money and have no benefits, have no worker protection rights or any of these things. I feel like we've gone back to the age of Robert Barron. And then you have Mark Zuckerberg and these other overlords. Like, should we really be taking advice from Mark Zuckerberg? He's a guy who couldn't have any friends in the university and he was too shy to even try to talk to women in the flesh. So he had to create what face mash, which ended up being the precursor to Facebook. But we I feel like a lot of movie, right? Yep. Right. And we all saw the movie, but the people that are directing society right now are the people that probably should be the last people 
to have any say, but because they're able to suck up so much profit. I mean, what was it last quarter? Didn't Google or Alphabet made over a hundred billion dollars profit in one quarter? Like the amount of money these tech overlords have is unparalleled in history. Yeah. I mean, this is a much bigger issue. There's two things you're talking about here, right? One is the sort of economic inequality, the concentration of wealth and power, the monopolization of certain markets that's given not only wealth, but also power and influence to these individuals. And part of that is good old fashioned government intervention, antitrust regulation, opening doors or encouraging ways to have competition and no monopoly lasts forever. And so I think that's something that we'll see. There'll be challengers, there'll be new approaches, there'll be new upstarts that may challenge some of these incumbents over over time, or maybe the government will do like they do in Europe, which is increasingly regulate them in order to curtail that power to encourage more competition or to encourage a sort of fair playing field, depending on what your view is, right? Or maybe it's a libertarian view and it's just like the next great brilliant entrepreneur is going to want to come and usurp these monopolies, whatever you think, right? And that question of wealth inequality and all that, it not, it's not limited to tech. It just tends to be concentrated in it because of the growth and the amount of money that's been made over the past 20, 30 years. The other thing about the pushback that, that you're talking about is in our own individual lives, right? And that's more what I'm referring to. This notion of when do we realize in our own lives that enough's enough, that it's time to put down the phone, that we want something. And I think I already see it. Like libraries, bookstores, they're bustling. People are not rejecting them because the Kindle came around. Concerts are selling out plays are selling out. Like people are voting to go back to these things, movie theaters, theme parks, like Disney's make, losing money on everything except Disney World and Disneyland. <laughs> like all the streaming stuff is not making up, but like, yeah, Disney World, Disneyland, Moana on ice. The irony of that, it's not lost on me. But all of that is like showing that, yeah, people do want that balance. They want that thing. And I think I'm encouraged by that. The younger people, it's not like they're en masse voting for all digital. They're pushing back. They're the ones who are buying flip phones, not their grandparents, not their parents. So that's encouraging in a way. Sometimes it's a dramatic thing, this sort of rejection and call to arms. And sometimes it's it's something not happening, right? It's the fact that like Facebook announced Meta, I don't know, a year and a bit ago, and nobody's on it. Nobody's strapping those goggles out of their face. I don't know, a hundred thousand people on there on every day, which is like a moderately successful TikTok video in a given hour. Like nobody wants this. Like people are just like, eh. It's not like, damn you, you know, to the barricades, like, eh, eh. And I think that's what it looks like, right? It's like you're you're not gonna see a metric of it. You're just gonna see more people in the park. Yeah, I definitely uh, see what you're seeing in that. And even I'm trying to be more conscious of my own habits, but just one more question. I hope we have yeah. time for as a parent, how do you parent your children then to navigate? Terribly. <laughs> like, like, you know, you want to teach them about the balance, but they grew up in this stuff. What would you tell parents? On it? You, like you, you need to educate them and you need to set limits. You and I and Jesse, our parents could have put us in front of the TV all day, every day. But they knew, even if Sesame Street was on, it was educational, like that wasn't good for us. And the same is true of kids today and what they're doing on screens. Like there's educational games, it's Minecraft, Roblox, they can learn, they can build things or whatever. But like if your kid's playing Minecraft for 11 hours a day, they're not some computer coding genius. They're just a kid playing a video game. And so it's educating them on this. It's educating them on the limits. It's, it's also showing them and taking the effort to do things like taking them to the beach, taking them skating, putting them in sports, taking them to a library, buying them books, doing their homework with them. Like my six-year-old who's become obsessed with Super Mario 3D World on, on the Switch over the holidays, I just taught him how to play chess. It's hilarious. But he's now obsessed with chess, obsessed with chess. And wants to play every night. And we have these hilarious games where he still doesn't know what he's doing. And I'm terrible at it too, but we're having fun and we're together. And I'm giving him that here's, here's a positive, healthy thing that we're doing that has nothing to do with the computer. There's nothing to do with digital. You'll still love Mario. You can still play on the weekends for your, however many hours I'm allowing you to do it or whatever, but you're also going to go skiing. Like I'm, I put you in ski lessons. You're going to do that and you're going to freeze your ass off outside. But like, that's important too. 
what are the positive things that you're doing in your life that are not some other thing that you're doing on a screen? Because you can't app your way out of this. You're not going to like, it's like, you know, oh, you're stressed. You're doing too much digital stuff. You need a meditation app. You need a, you know, it's like, no, 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 no. Like you don't, you need to actually put the phone down and go out and do something else to achieve that balance. And I think that's what I'm aiming to do with my kids, probably failing, but hopefully failing less than other parents, which is all you really hope for in this world. Yeah. Happy Valentine's, yeah, happy Day, Valentine's Day. Well, gosh, <laughs> th- we've had you on for an hour. So grateful. And you're so fun to talk with. And thank you for this insight. I hope you'll come back again. We really enjoyed this conversation. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Good luck to you guys in your upcoming wedding and life and finding that balance of the things that you do in the online world that give you meaning and pleasure and profit, hopefully, and the other things that beyond it that still matter. Uh, I mean, for God's sakes, you're living by the beach. So yeah. do it for the yeah. rest of us. <laughs> we'll be thinking about those Toronto winners when walking into beach and really take it in. Where would people find you? Oh, this is the part where I'm like, now that I've said all about analog, here's the website uh, on the internet, you know, at Sax David at Twitter, if, whatever. I have a website. I'm on LinkedIn, although it's so boring. I go on for like two minutes a day. You can buy my books. You can buy them in paper. You can buy them in ebook. Or if you like the sound of my voice, audiobook, 11 hours of this. If you want to reach out and share your thoughts, find my email on any of those platforms or send me a message. And we'll um, add all those. Yeah, me. we'll add all those links in the description. That's awesome. I hope that the world finds this book and we'll post the link in the thing. Yeah, we'll put all the links in the, oh, here we go. In the description. I just really think this is just an insight that the world needs. Thank you for researching and writing this book. That is it for this episode of El Podcast. We thank you all for watching and listening from the bottom of our hearts. And once again, if you're not yet subscribed on YouTube and Rumble, please subscribe. Um, And also like the video if you found it helpful. Helps us out a lot. Uh, in, in, in bringing more content like this for you guys. Um, also, special thanks to David Sachs. We're going to link his work down in the description below. Once again, thank you for watching and listening, and we will see you on the next episode.